Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Christian Reef Podcast. Today's guest is an independent author, a publisher, an Amazon bestseller, all the way from the US. His name is Gregory Deal. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hi, Christian. Thanks for having me. So it's a pleasure to have you on, on the show. Um, let's, let's just jump straight to the, to the beginning of your story. I'd like to get to know a bit more about you. Other than, obviously, I've done my research, but, you know, um, in your own words, can you talk us through the story of how you became a publisher? Well, um, I became a publisher by first becoming an author, and I became an author by first getting ripped off by another publisher. It's a very weird, stupid story that could have turned out very badly for me, but uh, she stole $5,000 from me to help me prepare what was going to be my first book, a business book called Brand Identity Breakthrough, just mm -hmm. kind of like a culmination of professional experience. I had it in the world of sales and branding. And this woman said she could help me publish it and, you know, make a name for myself and get my message out there. And um, she really didn't know what she was doing and was just bluffing her way through it and ran away with my money. It's the short version of it. Uh, but as a result of that experience, we, we had started the process and we had put together like an outline of what the book was going to be. And she'd done some interviewing with me to, to start to form the content of what the chapters was going to be and so after that happened i i said well i can just walk away from this and cut my losses or i can try to finish what this woman said she would do for me since at least i've started the process and i mean i do know a bit about things like sales and marketing and mm. so sure why not I'll, I'll write a book what's the worst that can happen and so i finished the book on my own uh it sold pretty well all things considered um I, and and it continues to sell even now, five years, seven years, almost seven years later, six years later. It was in 2016. Yeah. So uh, it continues to sell now. And I've written several other books since then on on topics like personal development and travel and education. I'm actually, the, work, the one I'm working on now is kind of like a prequel slash follow-up to Brand Identity Breakthrough. It's It's about post-Soviet mentalities of entrepreneurship because I, I live in Armenia now, a post-Soviet country. Okay. So the book is about comparing how Americans and Westerners think about business and entrepreneurship versus how people who are recovering 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union and communism, we just have totally different worldviews about the most basic things. And to me, it's really fascinating to compare how people who are in many ways smarter and more capable than me in many areas of life don't see things that I consider to be obvious about how they could be applying their skills or optimizing their productivity or things like that. So that, that'll be done really soon. It's actually basically already written. Excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah, that, I've got, I've got that in my notes here. So I'm just kind of like familiarizing myself because just for those who don't know, um, I literally came off the back of what we're doing today uh, so my head isn't even in podcast mode. I'm set up, but I'm like, ah, oh, what's going on? And I, I always prepare. I always have like a, a list of questions and notes about my guests. And I was like, ah, the author guy. And now I'm going through <laughs> my notes and I'm like, yes, that's right. So yeah, you're, you're origin, originally from Armenia. You're Armenian, is that correct? I'm from California. My grandmother was Armenian, which makes me oh. a quarter Armenian. Okay. Um, I, I moved... I got citizenship here first about five years ago, and then I moved here about three years ago to a, to an old house in a village. And as a publisher now, I just finished working on a book about Armenians written by a journalist named Ashkan Arakelian, who interviewed Armenians who were captured and tortured by the army of Azerbaijan during the, the war that happened last year over a disputed territory called Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, it, it doesn't really get nearly as much press as it should, which is really weird considering that Ukraine was just invaded by Russia and like everyone's talking about that. And all the Armenians are like, well, where was everyone when we were <laughs> attacked by Azerbaijan a year ago? Right. Like, so it's just very interesting to watch from the perspective on the ground here. So I, I used my experience in publishing to help her get this book she had written of, of interviews about people who had been tortured and, and just awful things behind enemy lines in Azerbaijan. And so that's that's an example of the kind of book I'm really interested in working on, uh, not necessarily just whatever the latest trendy, you know, self-help mm. guide or, or 10 tips to, to boost your business or whatever, but books that have important messages that probably would not get seen or, or even have the opportunity to out there if somebody who didn't know what they were doing with publishing didn't come along and, and help them take on the appearance and form of a real book. 
so that's interesting so you, you're kind of you are kind of niche in that respect as a publisher then that you you're not just going to publish anything you're going to look for those stories that you want to communicate to the world and and try and you know help those people that really deserve that chance to tell their story like that's yeah that's, yeah okay. it, it's been hard to nail down i i ended up coming up a couple of years ago i wrote my own guide to self-publishing and i had a lot of trouble with how to differentiate this book from the thousands of other books about self-publishing. And so the subtitle I came up with was how and why to write, publish, and sell nonfiction books that matter. Mm. And that that's kind of the niche, the differentiation I wanted to go for as a publisher is books that will somehow change the way people think or change our general knowledge of the world. Uh, you know, not just whatever new generic something somebody wants to put out there which isn't to insult all self-published authors but you know really important messages so what's your um kind of decision making process behind working with a particular up, up and coming author like what, what kind of is there like a, a checklist is there certain things that you're like okay they have to meet this criteria or they need to be um i don't know how do you judge that like what's your decision making process with regards to that I basically just need to see the value in what they're writing. Okay. And, and generally it needs, I, I'm more attracted to it if I think it's the kind of thing other people, other publishers or other people in this space wouldn't necessarily see the value of, but that I see, wow, okay, yes, that's, that's something that needs to get out there. I, I will mm -hmm. feel good about the work required to turn that into a book and make it visible to people. Okay. And, um, are there, are there any other kind of things that you, that you judge as far as like what, like what determines, I guess what I'm asking is what determines the actual value in your mind? Because one could make the the argument that, okay, with certain things, you know, you're not necessarily looking at it like, oh, this is going to make millions of dollars or whatever. You're looking at it mm -hmm. like, okay, what's the, the value here? Is this telling, um, is this revealing history that's otherwise not known? Or is this mm -hmm. going to lead to major changes in, I don't know, culture, legislation, whatever, like, what uh, explain to me the the value or how you measure the value what, what are the determining factors behind that value and, and then how you sort of come to your decision when you actually take on those those authors i think it needs to be something that is very niche in its appeal either because of what it's talking about or the tone it takes while talking about them which I think applies to all the books I write too. The mm -hmm. consistent feedback I've gotten since I started writing and, and much more now since I'm a much more experienced writer is um, people either love the way I write or they don't understand it at all. <laughs> they don't get <laughs> like why I can be very verbose and very wordy. And some people say, you, you sound like you're always trying to sound smart. And I have to explain to them, this is how I naturally think yeah. this is the most direct way for me to translate my thoughts onto the page. It would be harder for me to try to sound not smart or like a normal person or, or whatever <laughs> description you'd want to use. And so, and sometimes I just write about things like business, but sometimes I write about really heady philosophical personal development stuff that, uh, and, and I try to frame them in such a way that it's clear, this is not a book that you should just pick up, you know, out of boredom, spend $20 on it and, and hope that it tells you something interesting. This should be a book that really draws you in because you see, I, this guy's going to talk about things that no one else is talking about. That was the approach I took with the last book, which was called, okay, here's, here's the first filter, the title, The Heroic and Exceptional Minority. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> I think that even the title of something that, and the cover too, mm. my designer did a really good job on, on this nice emblem here. Um, it's, it's meant to either pique your curiosity, like that sounds like something, the kind of message I've been waiting for someone to say for a very long time, or why would I read a book called that? What is that even about? What does that mean? The heroic and exceptional minority like it. And those people should not read the book because you're going to open it and you're going to get really frustrated. Like, you know, with the introduction called the mythology and, uh, the mentorship in the medium of mythology is the, is the title of the introduction. Like again, another thing that's either you're going to say that sounds really interesting. What does that mean that mythology is a medium of mentorship? Or you're going to say I have no idea how that relates to me, and you should move on to another book. That's fine. So any book that I work on for someone else, I kind of want a similar kind of reaction that 
to a certain kind of person, it's going to appeal very, very highly. And it doesn't have to be the kind of thing that, uh, I mean, if it were the kind of thing that were just an instant bestseller to mass audiences, or you already had a huge following of millions of social media connections, you would either already pu be publishing it yourself because you knew what to do, or a major publisher would be reaching out to you say, saying that they'd like to print a million copies of your book because mm. they know what kinds of books will sell a million copies. So if you have that kind of book and you, and you have that kind of persona as an author, you don't need someone like me, right? You, you have other options. It's kind of interesting to me, you know, what appeals to the masses. You know, I remember years ago, um, I mean, this is a completely different field, but I, I was watching a, a wrestling shoot interview, so a professional wrestling shoot interview. And the guy speaking had been in the business for about 30 years. And he was explaining what good wrestling is. Like, what, 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 what does that mean? And he said, in his opinion, good wrestling was, you know, whatever sells the most tickets. You know, mm -hmm. like, it, it doesn't matter how good... Um, the match in the ring was, you know, it, it could be the, the most amazing match you've ever seen in your life. But if that's not what people pay to see, if that's not the main att attraction, then it's not. And he made this great point, which is what, why I wanted to bring this up. He, he mentioned this idea of you're appealing to Mr. and Mrs. Walmart, your everyday person. That's mm. the majority of people. And bringing that back to books for a second, when you go into somewhere like here in the UK, somewhere like Waterstones or I don't know, I, I, to, 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 I don't really read books a lot. I, I do a lot of like reading nonfiction and, and, and that and I listen to audiobooks and that's how I roll because just me personally, I can't, for some reason, I find it really hard to just sit and like read novels and works unless I'm using it for something. You know what I mean? Like I'm very much... I think I figured out I'm just a nonfiction person and that's all I'll ever will be, which is kind of sad. I, I, I know I'm missing out there, but I just can't sit and I just, I don't know. I just get tired for some reason. I, I find it much easier to listen to someone for like three hours. I do, I do a lot of audio books too. And I always make sure my books are available in audio because I know a lot of people really prefer audio. And, and I think, I think that's a good thing. I, I think honestly, that's, it's a, it's a great decision because so many books are consumed in that format. Like I, I recently listened to uh, the Martian. Uh, which is like a 10, 11 hour audio book. And if you haven't checked it out, I, I really had just, just as a work. I saw the movie, Matt Damon, right? Yeah. But I, to be honest, I don't think the movie's got anything on the book. Um, well, at least I don't know. The audio interpretation was much more hmm, poignant, um, powerful. I don't know, something like that. But anyway, um, to bring it back to the point, like if you look at those bestsellers, you look at those, I don't know, 10 to 50 books that are, that are the highest sellers, they tend to be very basic. You'll have a few exceptions, some notable exceptions, but generally speaking, it's going to be just, I don't know, some novel concept that appeals to a wide mass audience. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes to history, politics, culture, these kind of things, like you get occasional breakthrough things that come through and sell a lot. But often that will be because it's a particularly compelling story that's luckily managed to get some some press behind it and push it through that kind of mainstream barrier, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But there's so many wonderful, amazing works like books that don't necessarily get the recognition they deserve and don't get in those bestseller lists. And it has nothing to do with them being good books or or whether or not they're worthy of being bestsellers. I think it's just what I mentioned before, the Mr. and Mrs. Walmart principle of, you know, what is the average person going to be interested in? Are they going to be interested in a compelling story uh, of someone, you know, struggling in, in some part of the world that they're not familiar with? And, you know, because that's the thing on paper, it will, it will give you a, a blurb, which would probably sucker in m many of us. We'd be like, yeah, that sounds like something really compelling. I want to learn about that. I want to learn. Do you know what I mean? Like this, mm -hmm. this, uh, how can I put it? Like, like with me personally, I, I have an obsession with knowledge and learning. Like to me, the more knowledge, the better, you know, that, that's, that's my addiction. Knowledge. Yeah, same. <laughs> sure. Right. And it's like, but not everyone is the same. Like some people just want to, which I totally understand. I'm not, I'm not criticizing this, by the way, it's different. We all consume art and media for different reasons. Some of us just want to sit back and listen to something or read something and lose ourselves in that. Um, very much so like if you have a novel like, I mean take something like uh, Harry Potter 
for example. It's, it's a novel series. It's, it's supposed to entertain, transform, you know, put you into a different world for a while. And, you, and, and that's great, you know, and that serves a purpose. And when, you, when, you, when you've got something like some of the works that you're publishing through, through, your, um, through your publishing company, these works serve kind of like two different purposes. I suppose in some, um, they are supposed to entertain in a way. It feels weird saying that for, for if it's someone selling a story that's like really serious, it feels weird like, oh, this is for entertainment. But um, I would call it engaging. Engaging, yes. You have to find it interesting, sure. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that would be the, the entertainment value in it. It would be the engaging, in losing yourself in the story and learning and um, everything that's associated with that. But then it's also uh, a resource as well. You know, and the non-fiction market is so huge as well, not just the fiction market, but it, it, it's a totally different ball game. And I think, I mean, I don't know much about the book industry, but when I compare it to other industries from like a marketing and sales perspective, to me, it always seems like it depends how much money you've got behind you. Do you have the machine behind you? Do you have mm -hmm. the right eyes? Sometimes it can be as something as simple as, um, you know, particular people pick up on your book and they throw it out to the masses, you know, and that can apply to everything. Like, um, take my podcast, for example, I've been doing this now for nearly two years. I have 130 odd episodes. Um, and in that time, it, I would like to say that there's a regular audience, but it's really hard to say because sometimes it seems like there's a regular audience, then it dips and drops and then etc etc right so it's difficult for, to really say like has it grown is there a core audience that i think there are some people listening hopefully um but it's difficult to say and to read and to measure and quite a few people over 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 the years have said like oh you know what are your numbers like how are you doing are you reaching people are you growing and I, it's difficult for me to answer that question because i guess the short <laughs> answer well the short answer would be would be no you know, I'm, I'm getting a lot of fantastic guests and I love doing this. I love interviewing people, learning about people. Um, you know, it's amazing for me, but obviously you do have to look at it over time. Like, is this going anywhere? And to bring the reason why I brought this up is a lot of the time it will hinge on, have you had that shout out? Have you reached that person? Have you, mm -hmm. has to have the right eyes seen it? You know, you can be under the radar for so long before you, you get seen. Um, and, and that's the, the difficulty of it, isn't it? Sometimes it is just about being seen by the right people. And other times it's about uh, what's the budget? Do you have that budget behind you and et cetera? So mm -hmm. bringing it back to yourself, I think it's wonderful that, that people like you, yourself exist that have these companies, these publishing companies, where you are looking for people and trying to give them an opportunity and say, hey, I believe in what you're doing. Let's get it out there. Let's let's showcase your work and showcase your story. Yeah, um, and especially because you know we're never going to be able to compete with millions of dollars of advertising budget and and books in every store across the country or whatever. Uh, luckily, you know, because of print on demand technology and self publishing services on Amazon and Ingram Spark, the barrier to entry is so low now that anyone can publish a book and there are a lot of really crappy published books because of that but it also yeah. means that if you have something that is of niche appeal mm. but that isn't currently represented at least in the form of a book you can undertake the effort necessary to to polish it and make it look like a real professional book and get it out there and as long as then you get it in front of the right people like for example the the book about the armenian prisoners of war uh, the book is called sadistic pleasures silent crimes of azerbaijan there are no books written anytime recently about the conflicts that have been ongoing between Armenia and Azerbaijan. There's very little reliable information about what's going on in this part of the world. And so already the book has been out for less than a month. It is ranking them. You can go to Amazon right now and check. It'll probably still be true when this podcast airs. If you type in the word Azerbaijan, not even under the books category, under all categories on Amazon, this book is the first thing that comes up because there's not a lot of competition. There aren't many people writing books or, or making products specifically about 
Armenia and Azerbaijan. And I think it's true also for Armenia. It's one of the first things that comes up. So for people who are looking for that, which may not sound like a lot compared to some international bestseller that sells 10 million copies, uh, this is the book they're going to see and at least know about. And if enough people read it and say, okay, this is, this is telling me stories and giving me information that I'm not getting from anywhere else, you're going to recommend to uh, recommend it to other people that you know are interested in that, that previously didn't even have the option of reading a book about this kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Um, when, it, when it comes to <clears throat> approaching publishing in general, what are the, the sort of the key things to consider like, or look, look out for? Like, let's say someone wants to become a, a publisher tomorrow. Um, mm. I, I imagine it's not, a very, it's not a very straightforward process. Wants to become a publisher or wants to publish a book? Okay, so that's an important <laughs> distinction then. Oh, right, yeah. Do you want to run a full-fledged publishing house and help other authors, or do you want to write a good book and publish it? But I think you mean the latter. You, someone who wants well, to write and publish a good book. Well, no, no. I mean, um, my question is more like because you are an independent publisher, so you know, mm -hmm. while you're also an author, and, and we'll talk about that in a bit, like the the books you've written, but um, just you're essentially like a business owner with clients underneath you who you know are paying for your services to publish them to to give them um not only a platform to, to on which to showcase their work but also access to resources i imagine and other mm -hmm. th different things so um what what are the key things i guess you that are needed to become let's say a successful publisher well there's a very big discrepancy between people who have something worth saying and people who know how books work <laughs> Okay. That, that's that's really my job is to help them bridge that gap because it's it's been six or seven years that I've been studying this now. Like I wasn't interested in publishing books before until I realized I was in the, in the position to write one. I've always been a fan of books. I've always found them very interesting as a medium, especially really old books. You know that we can take information from hundreds of years ago and still retain it. Mm. In this you know this physical package, which to me is really cool, and the basic concept of a book hasn't changed since the printing press was invented you know it's kind of a timeless medium even even now with audiobooks and ebooks we still love paperbacks and hardcovers and so that that i i'm definitely aesthetically attracted to the concept of books themselves but many people who have had interesting life experiences or who have interviewed people or who have an interesting philosophy or approach to something they know what they want to say but they haven't figured out how to translate that thing into something that looks and feels like what you expect when you buy a professionally published book that includes the interior obviously the text it needs to be edited and proofread and and broken down into chapters that make sense it needs to be formatted with the right fonts and the right layout on the page so that again it looks like what you expect a book to look like many of these things are unconscious you know like you, sometimes you'll pick up a self-published book and you'll say this just looks cheap there's something wrong with this, right? And you don't know what it is. Maybe it's because the margins are too slim mm. or, they, or they chose a really bad combination of fonts or, the, or the, the way the headers show the page numbers is different than what you're used to. And again, you've never noticed it because every professional book you've ever bought has had these things done in a certain way. But then when you suddenly pick up a book that neglected to do them the same way, you're like, this feels wrong and this doesn't feel like a real book. And so that's one of the mistakes that self-published authors make is they don't conform to the standards, many of which are quite arbitrary, but they are standards that have come to exist and they're what people expect in the same way that if somebody's not wearing a business suit in an office, it's just kind of odd. Like, why, why is that guy wearing a swim trunks in the office? That's, that doesn't belong, right? So those are the kinds of things you, you kind of have to learn how to blend in and make it look like, yes, this, this is a real book that somebody put an incredible amount of work and refinement into. And then there, of course, there's the cover design and, and the description that people read to say that in just, you know, a couple paragraphs, what this book is about, you have to present yourself as, as a real author worth listening to. If you can do all those things, it's really just about learning how the major book ecosystems, like I mentioned, Amazon and Ingram Spark, those are the, the two biggest uh, print on demand publishing houses. And most people just immediately search Amazon if they even want to see a book exists at all. If you learn how those things work and you have a book that looks like a real book, then it's really just about getting it in front of the right eyes, like you said, because eventually the right people will see it and say, finally, a book about this. Finally, someone who's addressing this thing I, I've been waiting for. I get those kind of messages all the time. And you were talking about your podcast audience you know how hard it is to track like do 
do I even really have a core audience of repeat mm. listeners? What are people really thinking? Uh, that's kind of how I feel about my own books. I can see how many books I'm selling. Yeah. And I can see if it's consistent or if it's rising or it's falling, but I really don't know what happens to the books once they're sold. For all I know, half the people who buy them just put them on a shelf and forget about them. Or maybe they open them and say, well, this is trash and <laughs> throw it away. But I do occasionally get emails and, and messages on social media from people who said, I just read your entire book, The Heroic and Exceptional Minority in one sitting. And oh my God, it was, it was amazing. Like I've never read a book like this before. And that's nice because it validates, okay, there are people out there that are receiving it the way I intended it. I yeah. don't know how many of them, but there, there's at least one. This guy is one. So I have to assume there are others too. Yeah, I, I completely relate to that. I get the occasional message every once in a while or people going, oh, hey, what's the next podcast going to be? Or, you know, like I know there's at least maybe like, let's say like five people that always listen. And thank you so much to the five people that listen. <laughs> um, but it, 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 it's confusing, you know, like, because sometimes, and I'm sure you have the same thing where like different months or different episodes or, or different books, let's say, um, perform differently. So like I've had episodes where, you know, they had high engagement on YouTube or Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. Um, I guess like for a while, I remember on my audio platforms, I was averaging about 20 listens per episode. And I was like, oh, this is fantastic. This is, this is, this is progress. And now it's dropped down to like five, eight listens. And I don't really know what that means. Plus there's other things to consider like, oh, um, maybe, maybe it's the same person re-listening and stuff. And that's brilliant. But then also- Refreshing the page five times. Yeah, probably. No, no, no. Like sometimes people pause and come back to it. Sometimes people listen again, you know, which is brilliant, but it's like, I guess my point is it's difficult to learn from that because you don't know how they're consuming it. And like you said, like, let's bring it back to books. Okay. Let's say someone buys, um, they might buy a, 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 bun, a bulk order and you're like, okay, great. Or mm -hmm. they might, you know, purchase a book and then uh, purchase another one, but maybe they're just replacing the old one. You don't know, you know, it could mm -hmm. be that, that they're buying it for someone else and be like, Hey, you need to get this book. Here's your copy. Yeah. You, don't, you just don't know. And that's the difficulty is, is not knowing. And obviously the problem with that is it then justify, it's difficult to then justify your next moves. Like with me and my podcast, I, I just keep going. That's my approach. Mm -hmm. Just keep going, keep doing it. But obviously it's a bit different for yourself because it's a business. Um, so you've got to kind of make decisions with that in mind, you know, it's your livelihood. So you've got to be like, okay, sometimes there's going to be hard decisions to, to make. Like for example, if you publish, let's say, a book by a particular author and it doesn't do well, maybe you don't publish any more books by this person, or maybe you stop publishing their books, or you know what I mean? Like those those hard decisions that you sometimes have to make mm -hmm. because just the numbers aren't performing up to expectations, or or you know maybe you're making a loss on it, or or something to that effect. Like you know, yeah. Well, there are so many variables you can't directly control or even monitor once it's published. So I don't, especially if I'm writing a book, which takes months of my life at the very least, I don't write it unless it's a book that I know needs to be written and I'm in a position to do a very good job of writing it. Mm. And because then, because the last thing you want to be doing is going through all the trouble of writing a book, publishing it, and then it's not selling and you're wondering, well, maybe the book is just crap. Maybe it's just <laughs> an awful book. You want to be sure when you publish it, this is a worthwhile book that should exist, that is worth paying $15 for, that somebody somewhere will love. Because then the only question you need to answer is, how do I get that person to see and buy this book? If you're still wondering, was it really even a good book? Or <laughs> did I need to proofread it a few more times? Or maybe that cover design is really bad. Then you don't know why it's not selling. It could be any of those reasons. But if you're sure, yes, this book contains a message that I need to communicate. I did a very good job of communicating it and somebody somewhere will find extreme value in it. Then you're not asking those questions anymore. I know everything I write and publish is of substance and is of value in at least one very important regard. Doesn't mean everybody who runs a business needs to read my guide to branding or whatever. It just means that there are some people who will find it to be uniquely valuable that and that's that's something i never understood about readers and their expectations too because some everybody gets negative reviews eventually no matter how good mm, mm -hmm. or bad the book is right you can you can get a hundred five star reviews saying finally this guy explained something in a way no one else did and you'll get one guy who said 
I already knew all this. You know, or, I already read a book that talked about this. Yeah. Like, okay, well, like, <laughs> should I have known that you specifically already knew this when I wrote this book and tailored it around your specific expectations, buddy? Like, sorry. Like, I, I did my best to to describe what would be in the book when I listed it. You chose to buy it. I don't know why you were expecting something other than what I clearly said was in the book. It's stuff like that I, I've never really understood, you know? Yeah, so you, you yeah. just have to assume that kind of stuff is going to happen and, and move on and keep producing high quality stuff. Yes, I, I get a lot of hate comments online as well, and mainly for like skits or, or cover songs or, or whatever else I'm doing elsewhere. And, you, you know, uh, criticism is, is, is always welcome, I think. Um, because, you know, you can't expect to be liked by everyone, you know, and, and sometimes you can learn things from your critics. But um, yeah, sometimes they're just, it's, it's basically just trolling, isn't it? Like you see some of those reviews and it's like, it's like, this is not really to be taken seriously. It's one thing if someone said, I didn't uh -huh. like this book because of like how it was written or uh, the author's over-reliance on this particular thing or something like that's fair enough. But when no, it's there just... are reasons to give bad reviews. Yeah. yeah. The book is not what it promises to be, for example, or it really is just bad. Sure. <laughs> I, I just don't get reviews like that where it's like, oh, well, you know, I read this other book and it told me this and it's like, well, great. Like go yeah, read the other book I, I'd I'd be grateful if you were, if you wrote a review that was like okay, well I see the author was trying to do this, but mm. it really didn't work for me because of X, Y, and Z, right? Yeah. Or but, you know I didn't learn anything from this, but I can see why someone else might if they didn't already know what I know or something. I also think because we live in the age of um, where well, we have to be careful of of things being faked, um, negative reviews are actually very valuable because mm -hmm. it demonstrates the well you can never know 100 percent for sure if someone has like faked positive reviews there are some telltale signs sometimes but you never necessarily know 100 percent um but when there's like negative reviews as well and they haven't been deleted or you know or whatever that's a good thing it shows okay you know they're open to criticism um these reviews are at least trustworthy you know people have consumed this not liked it left their thoughts okay great and you know you let the public decide and this is this ties into a bigger point i wanted to raise with you as well which i think is really important is um i think in in the let's say the reading sphere book sphere um it's one of those industries that's always despite having been affected by technology in a, in, a, in a major way as you mentioned before you know hardback is still successful and it always will be um because you know people want physical things you know uh, vinyl is a good example of that you know it's the vinyl revival shows you that you know as much as it's great to have things online and technology makes things you know more efficient or easier you know it's, you can download any book and have it on a kindle great you know but people still want a physical like the the pleasure and the experience of reading a book and mm -hmm. opening it and smelling the pages or whatever like that that is an experience in of itself but it's also a industry that's heavily reliant still and i think always will be on word of mouth on reviews you know okay maybe it's not any more like you know a few a few people go into a group reading club and they're like suggesting a book to each other i mean that still happens but it's not wholly reliant on that anymore it's like i suppose the word of mouth is now online on websites like say goodreads for example um where you know people can leave those reviews and they build up over time and that is what ultimately decides if it's a good book or not with in terms of like the overall public opinion like if more people are saying it's good then people are saying it's crap then it's probably worth your time mm -hmm. but it's still subjective and the people decide and i think that's well, I'll, I'll give important. you a very good example of something that can happen and this is the first time this has happened on any book i've worked on mine or anyone else's on, on the on the new book about Armenian Azerbaijan sadistic pleasures. Currently, it has about 50% five star reviews and 50% one star reviews. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and I, I can guarantee that all of the one star reviews, or at least almost all of them, are from Azerbaijani people yes. who did not read the book because oh. they're all one sentence saying, This is this is bullshit. This is all fake. Armenians are lying ab about what we did to their country, don't listen to them. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and and of course all the five star ones people who actually read this incredibly detailed account these 14 interviews that this journalist did of these people who went through horrible prisoner of war conditions and were tortured and just awful things that you'd really have to be a very insensitive or bad person to accuse these people of lying about the horrible things they went through and so you you have obviously that's not a reliable metric of how good the book is because now it's got an average of two and a half stars half five star half one star so a discerning reader has to look through and say what's going on here why do half people love this and half the people hate this and which one am i more likely to be if i read the one star reviews and they're all just angry one sentence rants about this is awful lies don't buy this book and the five star ones are multiple paragraphs about like how important it is that this book was written or how well how well done the interviews were and, and so forth which kind of person are you are you going to have the reaction where you're just angry and yelling at the sky or are you the kind of person who's really going to gain a lot from the interviews contained in this book and you know fortunately because this is the kind of book that would only appeal to discerning critically thinking readers in the first place not for mr and mrs walmart Mr. and Mrs. Walmart will just see, oh, it's got a low ranking. I'm not going to buy this book. But the critical thinker will say, why are so many people leaving one star reviews on this and so many people loving it, right? Now see, I get to decide. And that's a cool <laughs> thing about reviews as well. Sometimes if something has enough bad reviews, that can have the adverse effect and actually drive mm -hmm. sales because it's like, it's, okay, well, it's curious. Yeah, it's right? like, why is this bad? <laughs> I, I must know. I must know why this is bad. <laughs> But yeah, if you're going matter. to do that, it's even more important that the book actually looks like a high quality book. Mm. Because if it were very rushed into production and not proofread and a, and a very bad description written for it, then you would assume that the bad reviews might be indicative of just the fact that it's a poor quality production. But if the description is very well written and the cover is really good and you open it up and the formatting is really nice, it looks like a really professionally laid out book and all these people are hating it, then you have to wonder why. What is this book saying that is pissing off so many people? It's probably not just because it's a poor quality, poorly produced book. Absolutely. Uh, let's switch it up a little bit. Um, what would you say are the, I say the biggest challenges associated with being a publisher? Uh, books, books are a long form medium generally, even, sh even short books, like the shortest books I've ever worked on were about 30,000 words, which is a bit over a hundred pages, right? Because anything shorter than that, oh. it's more like a pamphlet, right? <laughs> and, and usually it's more like double that for nonfiction. It's more around 50 or 60,000 words, right. two or 300 pages. My longest book was about 400 pages. Um, and so when you're asking someone if they buy a book, you're not just asking, does this look like a topic that interests you? Like you might say, would you watch a, a three minute YouTube video about such and such? Because that's a very small investment of someone's life and attention. Hmm. So not only does it take many hours of someone's time to read a long form book, it requires a cognitive investment, right? Especially if you're reading it instead of listening to the audio, right? You, you're really dedicating your time to, to staring at these pages for hours and hours and you can't be distracted doing other things. And so the value proposition and, and the sales decision that has to be made is not just is this interesting enough that i would read a book about it would i would i pay 10 or 20 dollars to have that book it's will i invest 10 hours of my time into learning what this person has to say to me or will i read a couple chapters and get bored and, and throw it away that's that's the hard part it's like deciding beyond just is this a good idea for a book but can i actually see it through to the completion of making it the full intended message of the book in the best possible form it can be and convince people to undergo that lengthy journey. I imagine that you've probably had to reject some, some people in, in some cases. And in those cases, why did you reject and what were the ultimate kind of reasons why you said, maybe this isn't going to work? Um, I would never tell someone outright, don't write or publish your book. The, only, the worst I'll say is I'm not the right person to work on this. Mm -hmm. That's it. In fact, even after um, the, the Armenia book was published, which again was less than a month ago, I've had people reaching out to me now uh, in, in countries I know nothing about saying, I've written a book about this crisis going on in my country. Will you help me publish it? And uh, I don't want to just reject them outright, but I'll say to them, well, the reason I worked on this book is because I'm in a position to know about 
what's what this book is about and see the value in it because I'm living here in Armenia and I and I'm privileged to information the rest of the world isn't that's why I chose to work on this book right that's not going to be the case with somewhere in Africa with some civil war going on that I know nothing about which isn't to say that that information isn't important it's just that I'm not in a position mm -hmm. particularly to help you do that which is why I wrote a book about how to do it. I wrote 400 pages about how you can publish your own book because that, that's the best I can offer for that person. I, I, when those people are touching me, I, I send them the PDF of my book for free. And I say, you know, I, I, this is the best I can do for you. I wrote, I wrote 400 pages about this. Um, check out chapter seven. It, it talks about the things you're dealing with right now. Good luck, sorry, because I, I can't oh. invest dozens of hours of my time into this. I'm not in a position to see the value of it. That's really good of you to to do that, by the way. Just on a side note, to send them that that resource, you know, like just yeah, respect for that. I I, I think that's really awesome. Um, which leads me on to my next question. In general, would you say that self publishing is sort of the best route to go for an up and coming author, or do you think there's still some value working with a major publisher? I know this is a bit of a leading question, and it is mm -hmm. relative probably to circumstances, but in your personal opinion, like which which would be better for an upcoming author? Uh, every case is different, of course, but I think if you're in the position where you even have to question if you want to self-publish, it's probably because you're not inundated with offer, author, offers from major publishers, right? right. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, I get that. If, if, you've, if you already have a platform and a name for yourself and you're writing something that for some reason you know millions of people will buy and you already have connections to publishers, um, then at least explore the option, you know, um, there are certain downsides that come with that. Like you lose a lot of creative control over what goes in your book. You're, you're only getting a tiny percentage of the royalties, you know, you're getting a much smaller piece of a much larger pie. Um, but still there are advantages that come with having that kind of support and backing. If you want to sell millions of copies of your book, that's probably the best way to do it. Uh, but most people are not going to be in that position. Most people are just going to believe in their own message because it's their message and, and they see the value in it. Now their job is to convince other people of that. So if I, I, I view it as, as a multifaceted process, you know, and you have to figure out what parts you feel comfortable doing yourself and what parts you want to outsource to other people, whether that's just hiring freelancers or hiring an agency or, or someone like me, I don't do any of my own cover design because I'm not a designer. I'm, mm. I'm a words and a marketing guy. I'm really good at the editing and the proofreading and, and the, and the structural design of what goes into a book. Um, and I'm really good at seeing who the target audience of the book is. You know, that's the way my head works. But when it comes to most of the formatting and the design, I, I have some people I trust and I say, hey, here's this book. Please do what you think is best with it. And, and I'll, I'll approve it. That, because that's, that's a much better solution than me trying to figure these things out myself from scratch. It's not what I'm best equipped to do. So whatever your strengths are, you know, that's, you need to approach the writing and publishing process that way too. What are you best equipped to do and what would you rather hand over to someone else? Brilliant. Thanks for sharing that. I really appreciate it. Um, I just want to run it back to what you told us at the beginning of the podcast. So you said that, um, and it was an amazing story when I was reading this, um, you got, you got screwed over by, was it, was it, was it a publisher or no, someone pretending to be a publisher. Is that right? Yeah. Well, the way she phrased it was she, she helped other people with many other aspects of marketing, like blogging and webinars and stuff. And she was moving into the space of helping people write published books. And she wanted me to be her first case study client. So she okay. framed it. She was giving me a really good deal to help me do this because she believed I had something valuable to say which, you know, is fine in principle, if that's really what's going on, because certainly when I started out, after I wrote my first book, I wanted to see, can I help other people publish books too? And I, I approached a friend of mine, who was an accountant, who I'd worked with, who specializes in taxes for Americans who live in other countries. And I thought, there's a really interesting niche subject that nobody's written a good book on. And I said to him, hey, I think we could publish a book together. I'd I want to try doing what I did with my book on a book that you write. And we came up with a with a, an agreement and the book sells really well. And I was honest and upfront with him. I only have so much direct experience with this, but here's why I believe it will work and why I can help you with this specific book that you want to write. So there's nothing wrong with making an offer like that as long as you can actually do it, you know, and you're honest about what your level of experience is. She lied about everything and she didn't finish even the, the 
things that she promised me. That that was the problem with what she did. If you if you'll allow me, I just want to kind of go down this rabbit hole a little bit more. Um, I mean, you're quite clearly a very intelligent male, so. Thank in my you. in my mind, I'm I'm kind of looking at this like, how did this happen? Like, I mean, you you said that certain things were twigging in your mind in the very beginning. Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, that's weird. Or oh, why has she been like that? Why has she been like that? But like, when, how come the penny didn't drop like straight away? Like, were you, were you just kind of more invested in the project that maybe you you were just letting this stuff go, or Mm-mm. was it just you just didn't sort of put two and two together and then it clicked later? Like. I can tell you ex- exactly what happened because I'm generally actually a very skeptical person and, okay. <laughs> and very confrontational too. If I think someone's lying to me or ripping me off, I will be the first to accuse them. You know, sure. um, In this case, and every other time I've ever been ripped off in any kind of major way in my life, it's been for the same reason because we came from a, a shared community of online entrepreneurs. It was called the Dynamite Circle. You might have heard of them, a bunch of digital nomads and location independent type people. Okay. And we had a lot of mutual connections. And she had a, had a big presence within that community, which is the uh-huh. reason I was willing to overlook my normal amount of skepticism. Because in my mind, if someone who I share a large community with is going to rip me off, it's going to hurt them a lot in the long run. And they should be smart enough to recognize that the reputational damage it would do to them just for $5,000 wouldn't be worth it to someone who's smart enough to realize that. But I didn't take into account that some people are narcissists and have huge egos and can never admit that they're wrong about something. Okay. That, and that's what it ended up being. She, she in, in public displays on Facebook and, and in forums, she it was like screaming, how dare you accuse me of, of stealing from you? I'm blocking you now. Don't contact me again. Okay. Uh, you're misrepresenting. I never agreed to do these things for you. I didn't take your money. Like she totally lost her mind. I was expecting her to act like a rational, professional human being like, oh, I screwed up. I can't actually deliver the things you want. Let's work out a partial refund situation or something because right. I need to save my reputation now. That's what I would do in that situation if I overpromised and realized I couldn't deliver. Right. But some people have problems. Okay. So, I mean, did you ever kind of get any like justice for this? Like, did you, did you get your money back or I don't know, did, was there some legal action involved? I mean, like, I mean, I understand obviously like ultimately that book got made and then that was Mm -hmm. the success and that's fantastic that it got made and at least it wasn't for nothing, you know, but in terms of that specific instance, like, did you ever get any comeuppance on that? Do you know if that person has continued to sort of mess other people around? Like, do you know any, well, took us through like what came. I did not get my money back, but I know that she certainly lost more via reputational harm from what happened than she gained from taking my $5,000. So I feel good about that at least. Mm -hmm. Um, She's actually kind of hard to find online now. Like if you Google her name or the name of the company she was using at the time, it's, it's hard to find. And and I've have public reviews posted of her saying that this woman stole $5,000 from me. She led me on for months, blah, 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 blah. So that information is out there and I'm sure she still gets clients who would have worked with her that, now find out the truth about her and choose not to. So again, I, I don't know what kind of rational decision somebody, especially somebody who understands the basics of internet marketing and, and reputation and branding, like why would you risk that level of damage to yourself for life? One thing I'm very surprised about, um, because America is often, often you know, it's joked about, it's memed about as, as being a nation of suing culture. And unfortunately mm-hmm. that's kind of, made its way to the UK in some short form but in America it's you know it's crazy you know you you sue people just for looking at you a bit funny um but with in this particular instance I'm surprised did this person not take any legal action towards you I mean you said about them online like this person screwed me over just so you know don't don't do business with this person Mm -hmm. like you, you put you put that on public platforms and that's enough to obviously you know, you can, you can sue someone over that for misrepresentation or something or Mm -hmm. libel or whatever the case may be. Um, It stuns me that this person didn't pursue anything to that regard. Like you didn't receive Uh, any pushback? One, she's obviously poor because she had to steal $5,000 from me. Right. Okay. So she wouldn't have (laughs) had the money. to. to, to, to And and two, she knows I'm telling the truth. She knows that any serious inquiry into this, I will be able to prove that I'm telling the truth. 
right? That if lawyers actually got got down into it and reviewed our contract and our emails and what work was or wasn't delivered, okay. they'd see that I'm actually telling the truth. Libel has has to be untrue, right? It, I, me posting a negative review of you isn't against the law if it reflects reality. If I, I hired this person and they did a bad job, that's that's not against the law, right? Is there any advice you could give to people listening to this that, you know, want to kind of avoid this? Because I mean, I, I know this is not exactly the sort of situation that would have been easy to, to spot straight away. But now that you sort of come out the other end, is there anything maybe that you overlooked or anything that you've learned coming out of it that you could suggest as advice to other people like, hey, avoid this, like, you know, don't don't do this? There are a lot of general tips that certainly apply. Like uh, she was way too eager to get the project started as quickly as possible. I'm assuming she was desperate for money. Um, when I work with someone, someone I'm going to potentially be taking thousands of dollars from and working with pretty tightly for months on end, I tell them up front, here's what to expect, the level of work that's going to be required and, and here are the risks. And I cannot guarantee that people are going to love and buy this book. I just want to prepare you that this is what we're going into. If you feel confident about making that decision, we can get started. Then we can sign a contract and send me the first payment. Uh, anyone who doesn't do that with a really big, long, risky project like writing and publishing a book uh, has their reasons for doing that. That that would be my number one thing. And of course, there's other things like, have they done this before? I, I can show people now the books I've written and books I've published for other people, and they can buy those and check them out and decide if they think they're high quality or not. You know. Okay. Thank you very much for, sh for sharing that. Um, let's switch it up again. So obviously I mentioned at the beginning of this that you're an Amazon bestseller. Tell us what it meant for you to become an Amazon bestseller in the context of public relations, sales, and selling for small business. Honestly, it doesn't mean very much. It's kind of just a useful marketing term. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I know I put that on the description of the book, like number one in, in the in the category of sales and whatever, because people respond to, to claims like that, but it really doesn't mean that much. It just means that for at least a temporary amount of time, your book was outranking all others within a particular subcategory on Amazon. And that's not total sales. That's like sales over a certain amount of time. It's constantly okay. changing. So if if you just happen to sell a lot of copies on one day, you'll shoot up in the rankings. That's all it takes to say, yes, I got to number one in this, this one subcategory. I'm a bestseller. You Man, know, I, that doesn't indicate anything to me. I appreciate this refreshing honesty. <laughs> I, I imagine like a lot of people I interviewed, like they might sort of turn around and be like, oh yeah, you know, it's it great. It did this for the book, did that for the book. And you're just like straight up like, yeah. I always laugh when people say that <laughs> to me about their books as if I don't know what that means. Like, yes, my book was an Amazon bestseller. I'm like, okay, good for you. Pat yourself on the back. Right. Like most people don't know what that means, but other authors will know what that means. So what, what are you trying to brag to me about? Do you think so, I don't know? <laughs> so would, would you say in general, it's quite easy to become a best seller on Amazon then? Like it's not, it's not diff too difficult to achieve that. In, in well, general. if you choose a very uncompetitive subcategory to go in, okay. then yes. And you can choose a subcategory completely unrelated to your book. You may have noticed this sometimes on Amazon. If, you, if you're looking through different categories, you'll see like a children's coloring book in some obscure Russian history subcategory or something, because the person who published the children's coloring book realized it would be very easy to rank highly in this category. So they just put it in there so that they could say, look how highly my book is ranking. It's, it's absurd. I never knew about that. That's crazy. <laughs> Surely that's misleading as well. If it's of course it is. There, it. there should be some oversight from Amazon. Like obviously there's some level of interpretation of what you think your book is about and what categories it belongs in. But a children's coloring book in, in a Russian history subcategory, like that's obviously manipulation and coercion. Madness. Um so Let's 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 focus on you you as a writer. Talk to us about your approach to writing books. You you mentioned before that you know it's it's a process. It takes often many many months to to do it. But for you specifically as an author, what's your approach to writing books? If I can talk about something easily, then I know I can write a book about it. Uh, writing is not difficult for me. It's knowing what to write about. If I if I could sit and talk to you for four hours about what I have to say about a particular subject, then I know that that's a chapter of a book. 
And when I write, that's what I should do. I should act like I'm just talking to you and explaining to you everything I know about this thing. If I can't think of what I should be talking about, then I'm going to sit in front of the computer for hours wondering, what, what am I trying to say here? You know, And I think that's the problem most writers have with things like writer's block, at least in nonfiction, is that they haven't actually figured out what they're trying to say. Mm. Just know they want to write a book about, here's here's my philosophy on how to run a company effectively. And you're either going to end up copying what's already been written a hundred times before because you just read these things in other people's very popular and successful books, or you're going to realize you don't actually have something to say. You just wanted to write a book about this thing because you like this thing, which is fine. But if I'm going to go through the trouble of writing a book, I want it to be because I really have something to say about this. Do you know, weirdly, that actually reminds me of something similar that I do. Um, so I don't, I, I don't just do interviews on this podcast. I also do discussion episodes where it's just me talking about a particular topic. And there are inevitably, I have to structure everything just in the same way that I would with an interview where, you know, I kind of go from topic to topic and try to kind of, I suppose, have like something that the listener can follow, you know, like a, a narrative or, you know, just, a, just an easy flow, so to speak, that you can, you can follow. And, and in a discussion episode, one of the key factors is what you said before, like, what am I trying to say? What's the point here? Like, the, for instance, I'm planning on doing an episode about um, sleep paralysis and sleep apnea. So spoiler for those, <laughs> that's, that's coming up at some point. Um, but the thing that I'm struggling with, and I haven't actually finished the research for it, is what am I trying to say? What's the point? Mm -hmm. Like, I can easily sit and talk about this for ages and read facts and, and talk about my opinions on it. But that's not good enough. That's not, well, what does that mean? Like, that's just, just, just like anyone could do that. Like, I need to contribute. And this is something that you were saying earlier, something of value. This needs mm -hmm. to be valuable. And in my mind, it's I need to contribute something on this topic that means something. So for instance, I did an episode recently uh, about multi-potentiality and polymathy. And my point in that, there was two key points. One was that I, you know, shared my experiences on that, you know, realizing that this is a thing, realizing that this is a historical thing as well as, as far as it pertains to polymathy. And also um, the second point was that, not only had I realized that I was a multi-potentialite, but I kind of made the assertion that, well, hang on, on this logic, we're all multi-potentialites. So this not, isn't really like a unique thing necessarily. Maybe it is a unique thing to be a um, polymath, but um, because that's being an expert in several different fields, but like a multi-potentialite, you know, I mean, we're all, we've all got talents. We've all got different things that we're good at, you know, um, it's rare that you just have someone that's only talented in one specific thing, but not anything else. Like that's, come on, like, it's just not, it's not the case. You know what I mean? Like we're all multi-talented. And that was, I guess, and that funnily enough came through the research process that that kind of final point that I, I guess I ended the episode on was through the process of doing that research and, and figuring out and structuring it and creating this work. I was like, okay, this is my point. And I feel like based on everything that you've said, it's the same with a book, isn't it? It's like, okay, uh, it's very easy to contribute something to this, um, maybe even something that's already been said. But if I'm going to add to this literature, I'm going to add to this, this field, I need to either offer something unique, offer my particular opinion on it in a, in a way that actually makes a point, or just contribute something in general. It can't just be a mass rambling of things it could you know mm -hmm. and I, I always bag on about structure in podcasting um, yeah for well, the same a, reason a, much of the value of a book comes just from the structure especially with long-form content that it's not just a collection of thoughts about something that goes on for hundreds of pages well that's a, that's the thing i think i think it's um a learning curve for many people like you know i've mentioned before in the podcast about how I've, I think any podcast without a structure is doomed to fail like you can't just set up a podcast and you know it's just a couple of people talking, uh, you know, because they had some funny conversations and they think, oh, yeah, this would be funny for people to listen to. It may be, but you've still got to structure it. <laughs> you know, you got to, you know, and there's got to be a point. There's got to be something that people can follow as well. It can't just be mass rambling. And the book is exactly the same. You know, it's, you, you might make some fantastic points, but if it's not easy to follow and it just goes back mm -hmm. and forth, that's just frustrating to read. And I think a podcast is the same. Like, I, I always focus on, are we 
finishing a particular topic and moving to another one. Like sometimes mm-hmm. I have to jump ahead because I don't know, my guest has jumped ahead or it's, it would be stupid of me not to ask a particular question at a particular moment. But uh, generally speaking, I try to ask everything that I can within that mm-hmm. one topic before we move to the next one, you know, and I think a book is the same. You need to make your point chapter by chapter and slowly progress the story or the narrative or, or get to the point that you're trying to get to. And ideally every chapter should be building on the previous one and and adding new knowledge, but still sort of pushing that, that, that story onward. Yeah. And, and for me, uh, what you're referring to with books is called developmental editing usually, which is the first type of editing you have to do well before you end up proofreading the final version. Uh, Often when I'm writing a new book, that I know is a subject I, I have enough to say on to write a whole book about, I'll have maybe 10 or 15,000 words, but they're all kind of just random ramblings I've collected into a document. And then I have to sit and think, okay, now that I have kind of a seed of what this book is about, I have to figure out how do I organize these different concepts together? What order do they need to go? And there's a lot of copying and pasting that goes on, you know, or removing <gasps> redundancies or realizing, oh shit, I have to expand this whole thing way more than I thought I did. And that to me takes more time than just the sitting of type, 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 type. There's thousands of words done. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned before that people have reached out to you and told you, you know, how your books have helped them. Uh, What have been sort of the most compelling messages you've received or or the most noteworthy responses that you've received from people that have read your works? I've always thought of myself, prided myself on on being a really good explainer of how things work. So my favorite response is when someone tells me uh, the way you explained this uh, made me learn more about it in, in one chapter or in one day than in three years of trying to learn about it prior or in 10 other books I read before this. That's a really cool reaction. It's like I've optimized the communication of this concept to someone. And it's not going to be the same for everyone because everyone's brain is different. So what's optimal for one kind of person isn't going to be optimal for others. But because I know how frustrating that is too. Like when you're trying to learn something complex and everybody's got a tutorial or a video or a book or something, but they're all coming at it from different angles. And, it, and okay, well, I learned a little bit about the beginning and then I learned something that happens at the end, but I can't see the logical connection between all these things. So when I can do that for someone, when I can construct that bridge for them that bridge of understanding and they get it and they cross it suddenly they understand it it's like thank you you've just saved me years of my life that was well worth the price of a book actually that's one thing i didn't ask you about before how do you justify pricing like obviously you have to factor in um you know the the cost of distribution the cost of Mm -hmm. materials blah 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 printing but i mean because it must be difficult to you know to, to justify and, and figure out pricing. Like my previous guest that I just had on the show, she she um, she's an artist, and she, and she kind of said that it's like because it's only her doing it, and she's getting more and more renowned. <coughs> Excuse me, she has to kind of like keep raising the prices. Also, also with things like inflation and other things that, mm-hmm. that naturally drive business cost. But generally, I suppose it's the exclusivity of the product and that she's creating it that that generally drives up the price and that'll only continue to increase but with books it's a bit different as as um as i laid out before you know you've got like your initial costs that decide the um the price but then what the margin is i mean that's totally up to you like you know you Mm -hmm. can go really high with it and be like oh we're a premium provider of books or you can set it low and be like cheap books good quality like how do you decide your pricing well nothing beats testing, of course, which is nice that with self-published books, you can update the price anytime you want and and experiment. If I lowered the price, I sold twice as many copies. Or the opposite, I raised the price and sold twice as many copies. That's great. But also within book formats, there's a pretty understandable range of acceptable prices. Uh, If I charge $100 for a paperback, no one's going to buy that because it's just well outside the range of what people are used to paying for paperbacks. But could I charge $20 for a paperback? Maybe if it's a really good book and, or if it's 400 pages, like longer books obviously command a higher price than shorter books. Um, but also even shorter books, if they're, if I know that they're going to appeal highly to a very specific kind of person who sees the cover and the title and reads the description or, or 
reads a sample of the first chapter and says, yes, this is the book for me, that person will be willing to pay $20 for a paperback, right? Because they know, yes, I know I, this is a book I'm going to read. I buy cheap books as like a gamble, like, okay, that looks like it could be interesting. And there's a used copy selling for $5. Sure, I'll, I'll risk it. Maybe it'll sit on my shelf for a year and maybe I'll open it up and realize, oh yeah, actually, this is really good. I'm glad I bought this book. But even if I don't, it's not a big risk. So you have to think of it from that perspective of the buyer. Like, are they buying this as a gamble because maybe this will be interesting. It's got some good reviews or yes, this is the book I want. Is it even that kind of book where they can have that really strong reaction that they're willing to pay a higher price for it? Okay. Thank you very much for, for sharing that. I appreciate it. Um, let's talk about your latest publication. So you mentioned it before. It's called mm -hmm. The Heroic and Exceptional Minority, A Guide to Mythological Self-Awareness and Growth. What can you tell us about this book? Why should people read this book? Well, you should read it if the concept of being part of a heroic and exceptional minority sounds relevant to you, <laughs> frankly. Big, big words. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I tried to really clearly delineate two concepts heroism and exceptionality. Heroism is pretty much what we would colloquially, collo colloquially call being a, a good person or an ambitious person, somebody who tries really hard to accomplish their goals, but does so through like an objective sense of morality, you know, not someone who would like kill their neighbor to get what they want. So it's not mm. just a driven person, but a person driven by objective moral principles. And an exceptional person would be somebody who uh, because of the way their mind or body works, can't really categorize themselves the same as the rest of the world. It's in, in your own way, you have a sort of superpower, which might be being a polymath, for example. Like that's not something most people can do. And it probably affects every aspect of how you think about yourself, how you perceive the world, how you were treated in school, you know, or what the kind of jobs you're attracted to. That the the normal mold of how a human life is supposed to go doesn't work for you. You are literally an exception to the rule. You are part of an exceptional minority of people. And so people who are draw, driven towards heroism, heroism, as I define it, and are have these exceptional kinds of traits, I think end up being potentially the most important and influential people who ever live, people who accomplish important, meaningful things that may go on to affect the world for generations after they've died, people who will undertake great risks and hardship to do what is important to them, which is where we get the concept of the hero's journey from. Joseph Campbell and every great story ever told, somebody who feels impelled to explore out beyond their ordinary world that they start in and, and become part of this special world and, and slay the dragon and, and bring home the, the gold or whatever. You know, we, we have these myth arch archetypes of myths, which is why I call the introduction mythology in the mentorship of, no, mythology, the medium of mentorship. Yes, I forget the title already. But <laughs> the point I'm trying to make by introducing the book that way is that there are a reason we respond to these kinds of stories because they reflect something in us that must be applied in real life too, that reflects our development more than just the standard cultural model of go to school, get a job, get married, have kids, you know, you're just following instructions because they're convenient and expected, which is the opposite of doing something heroic and worthwhile, where you do have to risk things and it is going to be uncomfortable, but the outcome is more important to you. So the, this book is, is really just a, a series of categories of advice for these kinds of people that they're going to struggle with certain things related to uh, different emotional states, different lifestyle obstacles they're going to encounter, and, you know, how you can kind of virtuously overcome them without betraying who you are. Excellent stuff. Um, do, do you have any books in the, in the works that you can tell us about? That are... Yeah. Well, yeah. I told you about one that's, that's basically already done called Everyone is an Entrepreneur, which is like a okay. total breakdown of the post-Soviet paradigm regarding entrepreneurship and business. I really want to get that one published specifically here in Armenia because it, I reference Armenia a lot and use examples and I want to like show the Armenian people, this is what you look like to me. Like, <laughs> I want you to see that you can grow beyond this. I don't want to do it in like a condescending way, though some of mm -hmm. that is kind of inevitable because I am saying there's something wrong with the way you see the world. And okay. I want to show them there, there are better ways to see the world. So nothing wrong with you as a person, but you have been trained to see things in a very limited way. And the next one after that is a book about suicide. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. It's called the courage to live. And it's about people who are existentially inclined towards self-termination. 
is that based around <laughs> personal experience or is that like are you going to be interviewing people or, or what's still no it's very very personal yeah and that's okay. that's what i start the book by saying that i am not someone you should expect to be have been suicidal because my life is very easy uh, I'm financially comfortable. I've had many friends and lovers. I've been around the world. I, and especially now, I'm functionally retired at this point in my life at 33. Like I am not somebody who struggles and suffers. I am so lazy and so comfortable. Yet I feel like killing myself. Why is that? Right? Like let's examine where is that coming from? This this existential pervasive sense of that I shouldn't be here. The world is incompatible with me. That's what the book is about. Wow. I, I must say, I think that's incredibly brave to, to talk about that kind of topic. Cause I think, I mean, it's the thing that many of us can, can relate to. There's people I know that have, that have felt suicidal. I've had friends, unfortunately, that have, that have committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suppose the biggest question you always ask yourself is why? And, and then, as you say, when you, when you look at particular people's lives, like, yeah, I, I remember there was a guy that I went to university with and, I wasn't especially close to him. I worked with him a little bit. Um, a really intelligent guy, um, funny, you know, everyone liked him. Um, I remember the last time I saw him, he was, a, it, was, it was a bit of a rush to, to get somewhere. Um, he was involved in science. You know, he's a really smart guy. And um, like the, literally the next week, I just found out about it. And... I think I was just kind of I was obviously really sad, but really confused. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, I was, why? Like, and often the trend that I seem to hear and what I hear from people when they talk about suicide is feelings of inadequacy, which we can all relate to that, you know, feeling inadequate and, mm -hmm. and, um, particularly. But is, the, is that an external sense of inadequacy? Like, I, I should have a better job by now. I should be making more money i should have a hotter girlfriend or is it some kind of internal metric of i'm not the person i know i'm supposed to be oh it can be both kind of i mean when, when i think about myself i've I, i've had suicidal thoughts in times and i've been close and i think the thing that always prevented me was i tried to think about other people i tried to kind of think you know it's not all just about me you know even though it's my life you know you there are always inevitably people that care about you and, and they would be affected by you you know choosing that and and that's a tricky thing i think to overcome because part of you will be like well as i said it's, it's your life like you know um and you might even feel like that no, no those people don't care in that moment but of course they do you know, and, and people don't often know the struggles mm -hmm. that you're facing. And one thing that I always tend to do now is, you know, I mean, I mean I'm terrible at like keeping in touch with people. I'm just, you know, a workaholic and I'm sorry. That's just who I am. But um, I always say to people like, hey, if you need me, I, I will be there for you. And I mean it, you know, like I, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, make, I'll make time for them. I'll, I'll be there for a two hour phone conversation. I'll come and see you like um or i just sit and listen you know you just talk to me and i just sit and listen um and i, I try to remember to, to like ask people how they're doing drop my parents a call drop people messages every once in a while um and just check in on them just see how they're doing um because i think that is the key element to this it's like remembering that people do care about you remembering that you do have worth and value and and i think it's even more interesting with what you brought up you know yeah you can have it all i've had moments even recently in the past couple of weeks i've had moments where i'm almost um like angry at myself for, for feeling almost depressed i'm like well how dare you feel feel that way you know, well, what have you got to be mm -hmm. upset, sad about? Like, you should be grateful for what you have. You should appreciate the beauty of life. And don't you know there are starving children in Africa right now? And yeah, and it's, and they, they say, you know, and I've had people say this to me as well, that, you know, you shouldn't ever compare yourself to other people. And, you know, even though there are bigger problems in the world, like your, 
uh, the things you're facing, you're going through are just as valid. And I agree with that sentiment too, but I think it's, it's just different. You know what it is? It's, I always say it's like a big cloud over your head. And it's just, it's, very, it's like a fog. It's difficult to push that away. Even when you're hearing people around you say the right things and that, you know, that they're, they're, they're doing everything that they should be, they should be doing, you know, they're listening, mm. they're, they're asking the right questions. It, it's like something's got to click. Like I'll give an example that there's someone that I know who recently was feeling suicidal and they, they were going to go through with it. And they told me that they looked at their child, they all heard their child from another room and suddenly that just clicked mm -hmm. in their head. They were like, what am I doing? You know, I can't do this. I've got to be here for my child. You know, this, this is so important. This is, of course I've got things to live for. And it's not just about me. Like I said before, it's, it's about mm -hmm. others. It's about these people that rely on me. Um, and but the, the, there's difficulty in that too it's like sometimes you feel like you've got to be there for everyone else but then who's there for me you know and sometimes people will turn around and be like oh you've been too selfish but it's like no no you need that everyone needs time for themselves everyone needs sometimes you just need to like it's just people to be there for you you know like even even if it is just sitting around and just talking about life or or someone listening to you or whatever, like you just need to feel like that you're worth something, I guess. Yeah. yeah, well, and you know, I I would never advise someone. You should. The only reason you shouldn't kill yourself is because your mom will be sad, you know, or people people will miss you. Like like I would never say you should live solely for other people's sake right because the point is to find a reason that you feel is worthwhile and sustainable yeah. to keep living which might include other people right like if you have a child and view the obligation and responsibility that comes with that as something important and sacred that could be a very viable and impo important reason to stay alive like i have chosen this obligation to raise this child if i quit now i am i am going against my word and my own values like that's that's what I would say in the book. Like that's that's a reason, potentially profound reason to decide to keep living, but not just because well other people will miss me if I die, so I'll just suffer forever because I don't want other people to be sad. If I may, what what was what was the decision for you to keep going? Like, well, there hasn't been a decision for me to keep going. It's a series of ongoing decisions. It's, I haven't chosen to kill myself, so that means I've, I'm, I've chosen to keep living, right? Every day that I choose not to kill myself is a day I choose to continue living, right? Um, and I, I don't have the one all-consuming purpose like a human being I am directly responsible for. I, I look at the world and I see a series of problems that I want to solve, and that's very motivating to me. Things like, you know, torture going on in Azerbaijan that nobody cares about. Like, if I can help solve that problem, I'm in a position to do that, then I will help write that book. If I can give advice about something someone is struggling with in a way that no one else has or will, then okay, I will, I will stay here and solve that problem. Can I do that until I'm 90? I don't know. Or will something else change? Maybe when I get married, that will change my, my entire outlook on things. Like, who knows? Amazing stuff. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, you've spoken a lot about Armenia. And obviously, you, um, you, so you grew up in the States. Is that right? California. Yeah. You grew up in San California. Diego. Right. And you mentioned that you've got a, a grandparent in, in, uh, from Armenia. Yeah. Um, what actually drove your decision to to return to Armenia? Other than obviously, I know it's for work purposes as well. Was it just work? Were there other reasons? Obviously, that's a big move from America to Armenia. What, what drove that decision? Well, I was spent many years traveling around the world, just out of a sense of curiosity and exploration, and I was always looking for somewhere I'd feel comfortable spending a long time. I was able to get the Armenian citizenship because of my grandmother's connection here. So that made things a lot easier. But I also just realized I liked being here and doing nothing. Lots of places are exciting to go to beaches and Bali and jungles of Costa Rica and Paris. And, you know, that's fine. I, I do miss kind of 
constantly going to new places that the novelty was very exciting and you learn a lot about the world and yourself but i think it's also nice to have a place where you can just hang out for three years and feel comfortable and i don't know something about the culture is very old and authentic to me the people in general are 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 like genuine and kind of intelligent and in a way that is often rare you know uh, so most other places it would be difficult for me to really integrate and feel like i belonged there and this so far i feel comfortable here i can always leave i have a house here now that i put a lot of work into but there's nothing stopping me from well, COVID is kind of making it difficult, but in general, there's no reason I can't travel to other places, have multiple homes, or just take vacations in other places. But until I have a reason to leave, I won't. Awesome. Um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? There was advice I would have liked to received when I was a teenager or a young adult that, that I never did, unfortunately. And that's actually one of the themes of the heroic and exceptional minority is that very few of us are privileged enough to have sort of a, a mythological mentor to look up mm. to the, the proverbial Obi-Wan Kenobi or Gandalf or Dumbledore or you know, any of these, these really old wise men that show up in fantasy stories and guide the protagonist and say, Frodo, you must take the ring to Mordor. Or Harry, you're a wizard. You have to learn to use the force, Luke, and all, all that. You know, there's a reason these patterns exist in stories because they're really convenient for storytelling. You know what the quest of the hero is. Uh, that rarely happens in real life, if ever. Like very few of us have somebody who shows up and uniquely understands us and sees the journey we're on and say, that, hey, listen to me, kid. This is really important. You're going to need to know this for life, right? Um, I, I would have liked to have somebody tell me, Gregory, you're not crazy. You have a really unique way of seeing the world. And the sooner you realize to embrace that and stop trying to uh, just accept and fit into the way other people tell you life has to go, the happier you're going to be. You're going to have to find your own challenges and your own obstacles to overcome, but stop letting other people dictate the terms of life for you that would have been a really cool piece of advice from somebody I respected and could really believe, even if everyone else was telling me the opposite. Excellent advice, yeah. Um, well, let's switch it up again with what you've learned so far. What's the biggest life lesson that you've learned so far? Oh, hmm. everyone is full of shit. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. Like they just, most of the people who act like they know what they're talking about just don't. I mean, yeah. have you noticed this? You must have noticed this. Yeah. Everything is made up, everything is <laughs> improvised and, and arbitrary. And that's something you learn from traveling a lot, is that people have totally arbitrary ways of doing things in different countries, but everyone is sure that the way they're doing it is the best way to do it. And you, there's nothing you can say to them to get them to realize that. People are winging it. I, I, I realized mm. that maybe, because I'm, I'm 28 now, I turned 29 this year, and something in my 20s that I've realized is you don't just become an adult. It's you, like you get older, you get wiser, you, you go through things, whatever, but you, you don't, there isn't like this moment. And I kept waiting for that moment when it would just click mm -hmm. and I'll be like, okay, I'm an adult now. I'm wise. It never, it never came. Now I just know the right things to do in every situation. Well, I mean, I, th I think approaching each situation calm and collected is key. Um, don't react on emotion, you know, keep a cool head and all that. But yeah, it it goes back to to what you said. It's it's a key of 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 like realizing that most of us are winging it, and we are just trying to kind of get by mm -hmm. and 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 just figure it out as we go. There's along. nothing wrong with that. I love winging it. I spent my entire twenties winging it, jumping from country to country. But the problem is when you don't acknowledge that that's what you're doing, and you right. act like you have some kind of authority to tell people this is the right way to do it because it's the way I do it which is what most people are doing on most subjects, right? That's so true. <laughs> Instead of just, well, this seems like a good idea. Let's try it and see what happens. Just acknowledge that that's what you're doing. Sure. Um, as we draw things to a close for today, do you have any upcoming projects or final thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners? Um, if, if you want to beta read my next books send me an email that's really helpful part of the process getting early feedback from people um otherwise check out my books on amazon or go to my personal website gregorydeal.net deal is spelled d-i-e-h-l or my publishing website is identitypublications.com 
been an absolute pleasure having you on the show, Gregory. Thank you so much um, for being such a wonderful guest. And um, yeah, just best of luck with everything that you're doing. It's awesome. Yeah, stuff. thanks. Thanks for the cool talk. Excellent. And um, thank you very much to all the listeners of the Christian Reeve podcast. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know who you'd, who you'd like to see on the show next. And as always, be safe, be well, and I'll see you in the next one.